I'm Ewa Messer. I'm the producer and host of Poured Over, and I've been waiting to have this conversation with Vanessa Chan. We actually met through Gina Chung, who was the author of our Discover pick, Sea Change. So shout out to Gina for that introduction. But The Storm We Made is Vanessa's debut. It's coming out in January. We're actually taping this in advance, of course. But I'm going to ask Vanessa to introduce herself and the novel because it is, in fact, her debut. Hi, everyone. And hi, Miwa. Thank you for having me. I'm Vanessa Chan, and my debut novel, The Storm We Made, uh, comes out January 2nd. It is about a discontent and um, dissatisfied housewife named Cecily Alcantara in 1930s British Malaya, who, in her quest for self-actualization and for fulfillment, uh, becomes seduced by an ideology and a man and becomes a spy, as one does, apparently, and accidentally ushers in the worst, most violent occupation her country has ever seen. And we're talking about the Japanese invasion of yes. Malaya yeah. and the colonization. Yeah. I, You know, World War II obviously looms large, right, in a lot of literature, not just history. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of historical fiction, and people really do love to consume it and read it. And Asia seems to be a place where there are some gaps. So you really are walking into a space, and I'm, <laughs> I do want to ask you how we ended up here. And I know you grew up in what is now Malaysia, and your grandparents are part of the origin story for this novel. And I really, I want to start with your grandparents and the things they don't talk about. Like you said, I grew up in Malaysia. I basically spent my entire childhood there until undergrad, and then I came here for that. Mm -hmm. and I grew up you know, uh, surrounded by family. I was the eldest uh, grandchild on my grandparents, on my father's side. And so I spent a ton of time with them. I like to say that I was the favorite grandchild. I don't know if the rest would agree, but I think it's true. And I spent lots of time with them after school, just, you know, all the time. You know, if I were to ask my grandmother, who's the chattier of the two, you know, what happened during the war, Grandma? Like, what was life like? She just, you know, tell me to mind my own business, you know, go back to my chores and leave her alone. And, you know, I think that that is the way that our ancestors deal with trauma. They they want to get on with life. You know, they feel we survived. We don't we don't want to spend, you know, an endless amount of time reliving these horrific things that happened to us. You know, I think it's in the uh, author's note in the book, but I, I say, you know, our, grand, our ancestors, our grandparents love us by not speaking. They just, they just don't want to address those times. But also, like I said, my grandma is a very chatty woman. So, you know, if I asked her directly, she'd tell me to buzz off. But if I just let her talk, you know, let her live her day, do chores, my grandma just loved to story tell. And Along the way, as I was growing up, all of those years spent in her house, I learned all these different stories, some joyful, some hopeful, some horrific and terrible. And they kind of knitted themselves together in my in my brain for years, it becomes a part of you, as you would expect. And um, when I was ready to write this novel, those stories, you know, how to avoid getting hit by an airstrike, for example, was a piece of information that she just carried with her and let me know one day or the prank that she played on her siblings where she gleefully tells me that they thought she died um, while she was cycling home because a bomb had hit in the path but actually she was alive and she was thrilled about it and tells it like a joke but you know it's not really a joke and all of those things you know came together for me when it was time for me to write my novel and became like the setting and the backdrop on which I based this family going through you know some stuff it's a lot of stuff it's very intense. It's very, very intense. I think, too, it's important to acknowledge that the Japanese Imperial Army did a lot of very, very terrible things. I mean, obviously, there was Nanjing, there was Manchuria, there was Burma, and like, the list goes on. And, and this idea that the Japanese wanted to create sort of this Asian universe, right, that obviously they would be in charge of. It's a piece of the context, like we need to have that context is what I'm saying. Like we need to know that this was not a good thing. This is wholly separate, however, from the Japanese American experience in of course. incarceration camps. And I'm just hoping that people don't conflate the two. It's not a conversation we often have 
about World War II. I mean, certainly people know about the Pacific Theater and Hiroshima and Nagasaki and, you know, all sorts of stuff. But I think this is going to be a really interesting journey for some readers. I think they may not know exactly quite what it was like. And I feel like you did a ton of research. I know we started with your grandparents and the very personal, but let's talk about the research for a second. Cause you really, you do cover this very pivotal 10 year period between sort of the mid thirties and the mid forties. Yeah. But, you know, going back to what you were saying about American experience versus the experience of Japan, the Imperial Japan as an occupier in Asia. You know, actually, someone asked me yesterday, you know, did your grandparents, did your grandmother harbor any, you know, ill will towards Japan? And in my case, and this may not be true of, you know, other people's grandparents, in my case, my grandmother was always very, very determined to separate out the, you know, Imperial Japan and the government from its civilians. And you see some of that in the book because they're, you know, there are civilians who are who are kind. We actually, our family knows about a very kind civilian on whom the character um, of Mr. Takahashi is based in the novel, who was very kind to my grandmother and her sisters and who actually returned after the war to find them. He called down the phone book one after the other to try to find the family. And when he did, they drove, uh, they were living outside of Kuala Lumpur at the time. They drove that little car into Kuala Lumpur and went to meet him and he burst into tears and he was like, I didn't know that you made it. And after that, uh, corresponded with them through the end of his life, he would send her drawings, he would write about his family, he sent her photographs. And so, you know, our family has always had this um, understanding that Japan's Asia for Asia occupation mindset and ideology at the time is very different than um, its civilians. You clearly did a lot of work with not just sort of British Empire. I mean, Malaya was a British colony, and then it was a Japanese colony. I mean, this is the history of a lot of places like Singapore or India or Myanmar or, you know, there was a British presence before the Japanese came in, but the community, you know, Rachel Hang writes about this really beautifully in The Great Reclamation, her novel from early last year. And you have a character. I mean, Cecily's husband works for the British government, and he actually just thinks he's doing the right thing. Yes. You know, I think um, that this was true at the time and, and still in some ways is sort of true. You know, colonialism and, and the mentality of colonialism kind of seeps into you, it seeps into your culture, it seeps into your body. People inadvertently start thinking that, you know, white is right. And the closer we get to the mentality or even the skin tone of our, mm-hmm. of our white colonizers, you know, the better our lives will be and the more that they will accept us. And I think one of the things that was important for me to explain in the book that you you can't get there. Like you will always be separate than them. In the case of the book too, the characters are Eurasian, which means something very different in Malaysia than it does here. Yeah, Uh, let's explain that. You know, again, Asia and Asian America get conflated quite frequently. And I do think we sort of have an opportunity in this conversation, you and I, to sort of play with these ideas. You know, they're, yeah, you grew up in Malaya. I've spent lots of time in both Japan and Taiwan. I'm still a kid from Boston. (laughs) And I I think I will always be, you know, a a girl from Old Town Market in Malaysia. Okay. No matter how long I spent here. Yeah, so back to being Eurasian. So in Malaysia, being Eurasian is defined as people who were descended from usually the Portuguese, but also all of our other colonizers. We have had Portuguese, Dutch, British, and uh, Japanese colonizers for over five years. People who are descended from any number of these European colonizers are Eurasian. They have their own separate culture. Often they have their own sort of separate language, separate dishes. Oh, I didn't know about the language. I didn't know about the separate language thing. That's wild to me. It's actually quite sad because the language is primarily oral. It's sort of like a a mix between Portuguese and Malay, and it's sort of dying out because it's not written down. Uh, But my grandma used to speak it, and I know some words, but not many. Um, And so they have their own sort of essentially mestizo culture. Mm -hmm. And um, 
that is what one side of my family is is descended from. But, you know, because there is a literal white blood in the veins of this community, some people in this community, mm. you know, try to aim to be a little closer to their to the white side as opposed to their intermixed local side. That's what Eurasians are defined as in, in Malaysia. But back to the research, I definitely, you know, a lot of the stories became sort of the, the, the foundation of the novel, but um, I also had to do a fair amount of research into obviously the dates of things, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. battles happened, and actually into life, what what life was like during the um, British era, because mm -hmm. in a surprise to no one, there was much more written about that time than there is about the Japanese occupation. And so um, life in the 1930s, and also life at um, the labor camp, which uh, one of the children ends up in. That has a fair amount of history written about it. There's a fair amount of documentation mm -hmm. because both of those places featured Europeans. When it was, you know, Asian colonizing Asian, there was much less information out there. And I had to rely a lot more on memory and stories that I was told. When did you start working on this, though? You came to the States to do your undergrad. You had a different career before you established yourself as a writer. And I do want to talk about that for a second, because it sounds like you kind of dropped everything mid-career or mid-early <laughs> career and decided to go get an MFA, which not everyone makes that decision. So where did this book come from? Like, did you know, were you walking around with this book in the back of your brain as you were? Let's, let's tell people what your job used to be. <laughs> So um, I came to the U.S. for for undergrad. I actually went to UC Berkeley. I lived in the Bay Area for a long time. And then I graduated and took whichever job would have me um, because I needed a work visa. And I had worked at this consulting firm that worked with bankrupt companies. Uh, it was weird. You know, hopping around here and there. My final job before I started writing full time was as the director of communications at Facebook and Instagram. Well, now it's called Meta, which I can't get used to. But uh, so for six years, I, I worked there and I was one of the sort of younger members of senior management uh, and one of the only people of color for a while. And then I like to say I, it's a bit of an oversimplification, but um, I finally got residency in the U.S., which meant I had some level of freedom to go and figure out what it is I wanted to do. And so I chose to engage in the millennial midlife crisis that I was having, which was, you know, what am I doing with my life? Like, what is it I really want to do? Where do I want to be? And so then I did, in a very organized way, dropped everything because I'm quite an organized person. You know, I started to apply for MFA programs and I moved to New York and started a program, which I did not finish, but uh, that's because of the pandemic. And then at that program, during a class prompt, by the author, Marie Helene Bertino, whom we love, came the earliest 5,000 words, essentially, of the storm which I thought was a short story and an assignment I was going to throw away after the semester. <laughs> As good teachers do, she told me, you know, I think, hold up. You know, I think you have the very earliest stages of a novel. So maybe go protect it and try it out. And then I did. And that was 2019. In two years, I had written this novel. But I guess I was kind of carrying it with me, although I didn't really realize that I always had these stories. They... I would tell them at cocktail parties. You know, I would I would talk about them. They're just like a part of our family's lives. When did you realize, though? I mean, you're t you're telling me here that you thought it was a story. You thought it was kind of a lark. You sort of thought that. I didn't think I was a novelist. Okay, you didn't think you. All right. I thought that you know when I was in my MFA, I thought I was a short story writer, and then I definitely, when I was in my earliest twenties, I wrote some sort of auto fiction about how much I hated all my coworkers, but that wasn't really, <laughs> you know, that, that wasn't really anything. That's just like the pages in a drawer. So I always liked to write, but I didn't think, you know, I was like a historical fiction novelist. I, that was never uh, a part of my ability to comprehend myself. And yet here we are. I know. So you're working on these 5,000 words that you think are going to be a tossed away homework assignment. And Marie Helene, who is fantastic. That's cool. Everyone gets an A if you just hand it in. You don't have to try. <laughs> okay. But she's saying, hey, look at this differently. Yes. 
You also studied with Mira Jacob, who, I mean, talk about changing metier, right? Like she goes from writing novels to writing a graphic memoir. She's working on a new book that is not a graphic memoir or is not a graphic project at all. And I'm really excited and I really can't wait to see that manuscript. But you needed community outside of what you'd known before in order to write this book, yeah? Definitely needed some distance from uh, from the workplace. You know, I know there are people who are able to write in the morning and then go to work uh, and then, you know, edit in the evening. And I'm I'm just not one of those people I can't multitask. I need like my brain to be completely clear. I can't have emails pinging me at all hours of the day. And so first I needed to do that. I needed to mm-hmm. just clear my, my, my brain and, and, and myself to give myself unstructured time to be creative. And then, yeah, I think it just, you know, I uh, went to graduate school. I, Mira Jacob became my mentor. Marie Helene became a friend. Um, as you mentioned earlier, Gina Chung was also in the same program, and she is a very close friend of mine. And I think I was very fortunate to meet a lot of different people in New York City who are writers who became have become friends over the years. And I think this community has has helped me. Uh, there are first readers, a lot of the people that I mentioned, but also I think they helped me realize that you can build you know, a life, a creative life. I had never had that before. My life before had consisted of solving other people's problems, trying to get promoted, and trying not to be deported if I lost my visa. And so I was existing in a sort of, I, I hesitate to use the word precarious because it was not financially precarious per se, but it was it was just a place where I was always sort of measuring risk and trying to make sure that, you know, I, I wouldn't do anything wrong. And uh, I think I'm now, because, you know, I'm not so immigrationally precarious anymore, have the ability to just you know, engage with the people around me, engage with the stories in my head and produce something. It sounds like you were living in a really liminal space. Yes. Like a strangely liminal space. I thought, I I mean, I was, I still believe that I was very fortunate, you know, not many people get um, to work in tech and get to learn all the things that I learned and have the security that I had fairly early. But also it was, it was tough, Miwa. It was really tough and a struggle. And I had no space for anything else. I just, day to day, I just had to, had to get my stuff done. And then I would go home and try not to die. Yeah. It's a lot. It's a lot. So I'm assuming Cecily was the first character who sort of appeared for you. No? Okay, you're shaking your head. No. All right. Who showed up first? When I first started to write this novel, um, it was a novel about three sad children living through a war. Oh, okay. There's nothing wrong with three sad children living through a war, but my personal circumstances sort of changed while I was writing this. This was early, you know, I started in late 2019, then the pandemic happened and I went through a series of personal griefs. You know, my mother and my uncle passed away and I couldn't, because we were all locked down, shelter in place. I couldn't go see my my family. And so I was trying to write about home without being able to go home. It felt like the most tragic of, you know, contradictions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm being a little dramatic, but it was, it was, it seemed pretty tragic. And I needed some agency that I didn't have. And so I gave it to, I just experimented with a character who's a spy. I really like like spy narratives. I was like, I'm going to give this adult character, the ability to run around and be an idiot and make good decisions and bad decisions and, and be seduced and seduce, you know, and all these things that I couldn't do because I was stuck in this apartment and couldn't see my family. And uh, lo and behold, this experiment became the emotional core of the novel and the main character. But it started off as a novel about sad children with no agency living through a war. I'm glad you made the switch, too, because there's a lot that Cecily goes through, puts herself through, puts others through that I think is wildly relatable. And it isn't reliant on this 1935 to 1945 kind of window that, I mean, she doesn't particularly like being a mom. She loves her children, but she doesn't really like being a mom. She doesn't really like being a housewife. She doesn't really like her husband. (laughs) She doesn't hate him, but you know, she's disgruntled. And 
her options were so limited compared to where you and I might be mm-hmm. now. But I think that's something that's so relatable for a lot of folks where it's just like you sort of feel like your back is in a corner and you don't really know what to do with yourself and you get this idea and you think, oh, this is a really good thing. Like she really genuinely believes in this idea of Asia for Asians and she really does want the British to go. Mm-hmm. Even though her family has benefited quite nicely from this relationship with the Brits because of her husband's job and whatnot, and he keeps getting promoted. It's not enough. None of it's enough. I think I've always been, you know, uh, really preoccupied with the idea of like wanting more. Like you can be happy, but you can also be insatiable. I think that, especially for women, right, that makes us unlikable, that makes us just unfeminine. But I I have always been um, preoccupied with this idea. Some of my other stories are also preoccupied Mm -hmm. with this idea. And I think it just sort of swept in there, this idea of this woman who seems to have it pretty good, you know, maybe not the best, but she's, she's pretty good. But she just, she wants something else. She isn't sure what it is, but then something else appears to her and she's like, all right, that, I'm going to, I'm going to try that. I'm going to try to usher in a different colonizer that will make things better for our country or so I think. But also the idea that she's so limited in her thinking that the idea of independence does right. not occur to her or anyone living at the time. It just has to be another ruler because you are limited by what you've seen around you. And so that was where it came from. There were moments where I was rooting for Cecily and then there were moments where I'm like, yep, you're a product of your history. You're a product of your time. I have to show you a little give it a grace, girl, because, ooh, there were... And, Readers will discover what I'm talking about, but she does, as you say, she makes some decisions, but she makes those decisions. It's not like life happens to her. And yes, this is, we are talking about the context of World War II and, you know, the invasion of her country, but she makes decisions. She doesn't always like the outcome, certainly, and she's always a little surprised which, again, she's a product of her time. She's a product of her class. She's a product of her upbringing. She's Cecily. She's who she is. I think she's not always the most likable, but I hope mm-hmm. she's real, right? That's that's yeah. my, you know, that's what I try to write. I try to write characters that feel like, maybe, like in Cecily's case, maybe a friend that you know who you're always like, mm-hmm. why do you always do it this way? It's wrong. <laughs> Better. You know, that friend. Yeah, I super don't need my characters to be likable. I need the story to be grounded. There are moments where the dialogue is very funny and very snappy. (laughs) Because life, here's the thing, life goes on in war, right? Like you have to keep You have your pet grievances and and your minutia and your crushes and your obsessions and all the silly things that you gossip about. Yeah, exactly. And, but I get, who Cecily is. Like, I understand her. Even if there are times where I, there were a couple of moments where I rolled my eyes at her and I'm like, come on. I know, I, I understand the door you are about to walk through, but real, okay. Okay, here we go. And, you know, you find out who your characters are in the course of the story, right? I did feel like I was fully in a world that I had not experienced before in fiction. That I was firmly in this piece of the Pacific theater that doesn't really get talked about all that much. I felt like you had done a ton of research, but you weren't showing me all of the seams and all of the threads, right? Like there's a lot of detail about certain things where I was like, yeah, there had to have been some lifting on your end, right? You can't make up all of it. You can make up a lot of it, but not all of it. I think I included what served the story. I am, yeah. you know, at, at my heart, I think I, I like to tell stories. I'm also, I think, I, you know, I've, I've tried to, you know, say that I maybe not, but I, I, I am a writer that loves plot. I am a writer that write plot in a traditional sense. Like I mm-hmm. love it. To, I love a turn. I love to read them and I love to write them. And so I include details that would serve that. And some of the other stuff, they just, they stay in your, in your folder for something else. You're also switching POVs between characters. You're also flipping back and forth in time. I mean, 
you're doing some stuff that for a first novel, some people might say is ambitious. It fits the, <laughs> it fits the story. No, no, it all fits the story and it all fits what you're doing. But I do want to talk about the structure for a second. You could have done this as a straight first person POV and it would have worked in a different way, right? But your third person, <laughs> like, when did you settle on the structure? How did we get here? How many rewrites did it take? So the first thing to know about the structure is that it's four different points of views across two different timelines, just for anyone. So I think the points, the fact that it was going to be multi-POV, I think was always the case. Okay. Like a multi-POV structure, in, you know, when I'm reading, I also come from a large extended family where everyone talks at the same time. I have friend groups like this. We have a lot of group chats. I'm used to processing information across multiple strands and then bringing them together and being like, oh, what's happening? So it's like a loud, noisy family where everyone is performing and shrieking at the top of their lungs. And that's just how I end up writing. I just write a lot of things at the same time and then hopefully they they come together. So that was always, I think that was there from the beginning. Of course, it started with three POVs and then I added their mother later, like we discussed earlier. The fact that it's two different timelines, so three of the children exist kind of in the last three to six months of the war in 1945, whereas their mother exists across 10 years from 1935 to 1945. And it's a cause and effect um, narrative. So the things that she does causes the things that they're going through. And that I want people to see that. Now that required me to march around my apartment because again, we were in lockdown, muttering to myself and drawing mind maps in my head and it was it was it was a tough time because it was uh, I couldn't figure it out for a long time. Actually, I think it was I was having a conversation with Mira Jacob, whom we talked about earlier. And I, I just if I write this mother in, I have to do so much flashback. And she goes, why can't you have two timelines? I'm like, because the rules say that when you have four points of view, you can only have one timeline. And she was like, who wrote the rules? Who wrote the rules? And I was like, I don't know. I wrote the rules. She goes, well, change your rules. And so, you know, with her her stern but loving guidance, I changed the rules and wrote my own. Let's talk about influences for a second, because obviously you've got access to a really talented pool of people when you get an MFA, but you were a reader long before that. I mean, yeah, there was the little break while you were working and whatnot and had no time for anything else, but I want to talk about some childhood influences. I want to talk about the books you loved when you were younger and then also sort of who you've been reading and who you consider sort of foundational for you as Vanessa Chan novelist. Those are two different answers. Yes, they are. <laughs> They're very different answers, I'm sure. But I grew up in post-colonial Malaysia. I read a lot of post-colonial literature. You know, a Malaysian child of a certain age read reads these books by Enid Blyton, which are about you know, girls going to boarding school in Cornwall or, you know, all these very British things, you know, they're little, little child detectives solving crime. And she's very prolific. And, you know, I read, I read a ton of those, you know, I read a lot of Seventeen magazine as well for my American, <laughs> American culture. And, uh, you know, I read, I read, I read everything when I was a child, I read literally everything. And then, you know, in, in the more recent years, we have had access wonderfully and for good reason to a lot of um, writing by, you know, writers of color, writing from places that are less familiar, you know, to um, the wider reader. And when I was writing this book, I would say that although the timelines are different, the locations and the races of the people are different, The Vanishing Half was actually a big totem for me, mostly because of the way she jumps in time, the way she has a lot of, Britt Bennett has a lot of confidence when she just wants something to happen she doesn't feel the need to lead you up to it. She just goes, something happened. It is one of the best books I've read in the last 10 years. Without it, like hands down, it is one of the absolute exactly. best books I've read in the last 10 years. I also love all these like messy narrators, as you would expect. So I really loved um, Kirsten Valdez Quaid's uh, The Five Wounds. There is a windshield wiper entrepreneur in there who is the worst human most useless human I've ever met in a book whom I love unrestrainedly. Yeah. And uh, gosh, I mean, oh, 
But Rachel Hank's The Great Reclamation, which came out more recently, was was wonderful to read. Another take on the history of Southeast Asia. There's so many books. I, I'm so glad to exist in this timeline, in this multiverse, uh, with all these books um, that may not have existed some years ago. Did you surprise yourself while you were writing The Storm We Made? Did your character surprise you? All the time. Yeah. All the time. I mean, I didn't know I was going to write a spy. I am not a mother myself. I, do, I don't know very much about motherhood. I didn't expect to write a mother. I didn't expect to write a historical fiction novel, Miwa. Okay. That's uh, fair. I mean, that's totally fair. I So everything about this novel is a surprise. It's reception is a surprise. The, the whole thing is just me clutching my pearls being like, is this happening right now? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, Vanessa, it is happening right now. <laughs> I'm very glad for it, but it is it is pretty much it's unbelievable to me at times that first of all, this is the novel that I wrote. This mm-hmm. is the novel that I'm going out into the world with and that it's going to exist in the world. Is it really the historical fiction piece that's that's sort of sitting with you in a wow, this is the thing that happened, or is it the honesty of the story? I you know, <laughs> I don't know if I, I'm the person to to weigh the honesty of my stories. I hope that it is. I hope that it reads honest. I think there's an emotional honesty to this book. I think your characters behave in ways that human beings would behave. I think some people might be uncomfortable. I do. I think some readers might, you know, their eyebrows might go up a little bit, (laughs) but it felt very emotionally true to me. And no, I don't have personal experience of Malaya (laughs) in World War II, but I think Human behavior is kind of what it is, right? And people show us who they are, especially when they're under pressure. And I think you let your characters do what the story needs. And it's not, I didn't ever feel like you were sending me on a path of, I need to make a point. It was always more, I'm going to tell you a story. Thank you for pointing that out, because I think that is always my priority. Mm -hmm. I want to write a story. In this case, you know, it happened to exist on a backdrop of, you know, a very trying time for this family. But at the heart, I'm, I'm, I have always been preoccupied with people, like we talked about, living their daily minutia and having their, you know, daily complaints and mm-hmm. joy, happinesses and irritations and obsessions the way and, you know, having their like physical manifestations of their anxiety, their sweating, their, their you know, whatever it is. And it's just the backdrop in which I place them in, right? You know, I I was thinking about it the other day. I think that, you know, we're starting to see the advent of a few more pandemic novels. And I think they're going to be the most successful are, again, the ones where, you know, we're just out here (laughs) living our lives against a backdrop of, you know, great horror. And 20, 30 years down the line, our grandchildren are going to ask us, you know, what was it like during the pandemic? The same way I asked my grandparents and we're going to tell them nothing happened. We just sat down and had the same frustrations, except a larger looming grief. And, you know, I think that, I think that my novel is that it's people, just a big, bad backdrop. You know, Alice Wynn does something sort of similar in her World War I novel, In Memoriam, which came out earlier in 23. And she balances these really intense scenes of war, like serious, serious trench warfare. And it was obvious she had done also quite a lot of research. But then you've got these two boys, essentially, these young men who are making their way in the world and figuring out what their story is going to be. And she does this balancing act. And you're doing something very similar here, I think, with The Storm We Made, where, again, there are some pretty significant moments of discomfort. (laughs) There's some stuff that happens. And it is, you know, part of the historical record, right? Like, it is part of what happened during this war and in this place. And if we're going to create art out of our experience, we kind of have to be able to hold both in each hand, right? Like 
you've got the good and the bad. Like you can't just have one or the other because if it's relentlessly morbid, you don't give the reader space to breathe, right? Especially if you want to create art that's true to life because mm-hmm. life is always relentless. There are moments of of levity and moments of of stupidity and moments of um, joy. And back to my grandma, she talks about, you know, oh, we were starving. And so our mother used to, you know, boil paper to have us, you know, survive, which terrible thing. But also she's like, oh, so sometimes at night after curfew, we would crawl through the hole that we made in our fence to our neighbor's house and we would have dance parties. Mm -hmm. All this occupation, both of those things can exist in tandem because that human experiences. Has your grandmother read the book? I, I hate to bring up death so much, but my grandmother passed in January this year. I'm sorry to hear that. Oh, I no, no. It's, it, it's, uh, she was 94 and um, ah, still. Aware that I was writing the book. Uh, in fact, she was. I was actually with her when I sold the book in January last mm-hmm. year. And uh, she was thrilled. But also, again, she told me to get back to my chores because I was wasting <laughs> time prattling on about this book. Uh, she was a very matter of fact woman. Yeah. So, you know, she has not read it, but she uh, is in the dedication and she was aware that I was writing it. She gifted me some of her memory books, which essentially were journals, but just, you know, stories that she'd written down so she wouldn't forget them. And, you know, we used to talk a lot about her life in this book. That must be a little wild for you, though, reading your grandmother's diary. Yeah, it's funny because I think she wrote, wrote them as intended to have an audience. So there right. was nothing very, like, too spicy in there. Okay. All right. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you for answering the question where I was like, how do I ask about your grandma? <laughs> Find some letters that she had, her and my grandfather had written, and those were a little mm. spicy, and, and um, my aunt keeps them. I, I find them awkward. <laughs> I understand that. What do you want readers to really know about the storm we made? I mean, it is your first novel. There's a story collection coming next year. Yeah, maybe. Next year, year after, something like that. So they're going to have time to sit with the storm we made. But what do you want readers to know? I just want them to, you know, hopefully hold and remember some of the stories um, in the storm we made, right? Because I think, you know, remembering is how history is made. Remembering is how people love. And I hope, you know, that they carry a little bit of, of you know, Cecily's drama and, and, and Juju, her eldest daughter's, you know, uh, stories of, both anger and hope and Abel and Jasmine stories. I hope I hope that they come away from this book with like some memory of the book. You know, sometimes you read a book and you don't remember anything about it. I hope that they remember something of it because there's history in there. And um, when you remember something, it becomes history. And I want that to happen. I think too, the humanity and the history don't get separated, right? Like you can't have a history without the humanity of the thing. I'm hoping that readers come to this with an open mind. Because again, like you are kind of in slightly uncharted territory for American publishing, right? Like keep an open mind, right? Like there's a lot of sort of emotional happenings. We are obviously spoiler free in this conversation. So I know it sounds like we're dancing around stuff, but one of the great pleasures for me when I was reading this book, and I read it early, early, I mean... I was working off of a bound manuscript, so I didn't see the jacket until very late. And we're going to end on the jacket because the jacket's pretty spectacular. But I hadn't seen the jacket. I hadn't actually met you yet. And I just read it. And I sat. I think I read it straight through in a single sitting kind of thing because I just needed to know where you were going. And, you know, who was going to live, who was not going to live. And again, you don't necessarily need to have a huge understanding of what was happening in that time period, right? Like you just need to trust that Vanessa is going to tell you a story. It is a quick propulsive read. You are the plot that like, you do not stint on plot. You do not stint on plot. But I also got some great sentences out of it too, which made me very happy. (laughs) But before I let you go, we got to talk about this jacket because the jacket is amazing. And there's a little bit of a backstory that I think, Kind of sums up a little bit of how you approach the world. (laughs) What? Well, didn't you find this painting and you were like, this is what I want? Am I I misremembering the story? 
I expected to have a full, long, drawn out, you know, cover selection process, which is uh-huh. sometimes with, with writers, right? Your team presents you with options and then you hate all of them and they present you with new options. So you got to tweak and tweak and tweak. It could take months. Uh, my team presented me with three options, two that were designed and one that was literally a piece of art that they found on Google. And I was like, that's it. That's that's that. Oh, that's so it. your team, I thought you found, oh, I thought you found you know, it. But, but then later they told me, oh, do you know that this this piece of art is painted by a Malaysian artist? Mm-hmm. It's like, y'all could have started with that. <laughs> <laughs> that is very important. And um, it all sort of, you know, came together in a multitude of wonderful coincidences. And we basically mm-hmm. had a jacket in a day. They just put some words on this amazing piece of art. We went to the gallery artist and secure the rights for it. And now it's going to be in the US, but also in multiple covers around the world. That is so great. I, yeah. for some reason, I had it in the back of my head that you had found the piece of art, but okay. Oh, no, no, no. The team did. Well, yay team. Yay, Thanks. Mary Sue Rucci books. Yes. Um, and yeah, so it's a Malaysian artist on the jacket, a Malaysian uh, audiobook narrator as well. Mm-hmm. Gang of Malaysians. You know, Vanessa, I think that's pretty much the perfect place to end this episode. So thank you so much for making the time for us. It's always really good to see you. The Storm We Made is out now. And since we went spoiler free in this conversation, everyone can run out and just read it for themselves and enjoy it and be astonished by it. How does that sound? Wonderful. Thank you for having me. It's always a joy to talk to you. Cool. Thank you for listening. Poured Over is a Barnes & Noble production. To help other readers find us, Please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts.